demonstration how you feel um, about the situation, which is the restriction of our union's freedom, and we, our union is very necessary. A defence against being exploited, those are their only means of getting their opinion across to the hierarchy. And if a government chooses to put um, someone in charge of us, a registrar, we are no longer being able truly to express ourselves. Like, they would prevent student unions from donating to, use to the UCS yes fund. They, they would restrict any they? political yeah. activity. Yeah. We sort of saw the street crowding up, and then people say, they're around the corner, they're around the corner. And then yeah. anyone realised sort of the amount mm, of people that were terrific. Yeah, nobody did. Yeah. And then there was, a, there was a tremendous atmosphere. There was a solidarity. Mm, there was definitely, yes. There was a good communication between yeah. people as well. We knew what we were doing then. A very enjoyable part of that uh, demonstration was, was the thought that you, we just totally held up London, marching through London, walking through Oxford oh, Street yeah. and Regent Street, yeah. and knowing that various people who were in you know, rush hours and various yeah, other things. What a shame business. it didn't have more effect then. The fact that the nationals, the national papers, you know, put so much space to it. You know, the, like that Prince Philip thing, you know, in the, in the Daily yeah, Express, paragraph. you know, <laughs> a small paragraph with Prince Philip held up in block letters and underneath saying, uh, Prince Philip was held up in Oxford Street, you know, yesterday due to demonstrate, the students demonstrate, militant students right. demonstrating maybe, you know. When we got to Parliament and there were such terrific queues to go into lobbying and the police started getting quite restrictive and only let in, what was it, 100 people on the whole. I think then there was a slight disillusionment, but it wasn't disillusionment with fellow students. It was just, again, disillusionment with the, the system. One, two, three, four. We don't want the Tory law. Five, six, seven, eight. Tories want a fascist state. One, two, three, four. We don't want the Tory law. We don't want the
going to be run. They're our unions and we've got to keep them. These would result in the splitting of student unions into activities that were funded out of students' own pockets, clubs and societies, and a whole host of other things falling into a, a grey and undefined area. Things like newspapers, capital expenditure for entertainment, student community action. And on the other hand, handing over the funding of the other activities of the student unions that would still exist and be freely available to all students handing the funding over to the college authorities. And the principal says, oh, come in, Mr. X, Miss Y, please sit down. Um, but before you come talk about that, there's something I want to raise with you, and that is the college estimates are coming up next week, and um, there's a number of people who are going to try and uh, uh, cut down on the amount of money that's given to the student union. Now, you know, I'm your friend, I'm against that. We can't have that sort of thing, but there are a lot of people in this college who are campaigning for that sort of thing. Um, now, if you can... Help me a bit, I'll try and help you. Now, what was it what you wanted to see me about? In the majority of student unions, particularly the smaller colleges, the tech colleges, further education colleges, the colleges of education, I'm afraid the college authorities are like that. Very few student unions are, can anyway claim to be independent or autonomous, but uh, the present proposal will certainly make that, that sort of aim impossible. Um, and it's the establishment of this sort of company unionism, um, which I think is the most uh, important, and this sort of the, the control of the student union by the college authorities, which is the most important uh, effect of these proposals, should they be implemented. But it's a sort of uh, an extension, as I've outlined before, of the Tories' whole strategy. government have got enough on their plate with the anti-trade union legislation, Ireland and so forth, without picking on the students. Why in fact are the government deciding to make these inroads into the students union? And I suppose that you, are, you would argue like the trade union members would, if there's anything wrong with your union, the members themselves would put it right, we wouldn't want any state interference. There is a reason why the students union under attack and that there's basically it's the same reason why the trade union movement is under attack. It comes down to a simple question that in spite of all the forces that are arranged against us, the British working class, and that includes you as well, unless you want to disassociate yourself from the British working class, I believe your workers, won't be tamed. What we have got to understand though that the attack is now on, not only against the trade union movement, but against all sections of the working class, and they're doing this for one reason and one reason only, is because the crisis is upon them, whether or not they get out of it will very much depend on us. What we've got to make sure is that they don't solve their crisis at the expense of us. I'm not one of these people that say that your problems can be solved by singing out the slogan, he fell. That's an oversimplification of what the real problem is. It's not a question of just saying he fell, because the government before this one pursued an almost identical policy. It's just variations on the theme. If we can find our own ideology, understand our history, understand the contradictions and the class forces, we can come up with the right answers. You ought to consider now going on to the offensive, not defending what you've already got, but going into battle to develop this kind of unity that's necessary to take on the common enemy. Education is part of the division of labour in advanced capitalist society. It divides, on the one hand, those who define other people by planning for them, inventing for them, giving them orders in various ways. And on the other hand, the rest of us who are supposed to take these orders. Education is preparing us as students for a particular role in that division. Not the very top roles, 
but middle roles. So although we haven't got the greatest amount of privilege possible and the greatest power possible, nonetheless, we're being trained in such a way that we can't help but oppress most other people if we use that training as it's supposed to be used. <laughs> Because there are more and more of these middle roles, and it's because education has been expanded in order to supply this greater number, that the whole character of the radicalism or revolutionism of educated people has changed. And it's changing in our time. We have to recognize how. While we still have, as a result of our training, differences from the masses of working people, Nonetheless, they're, they're important grounds for sympathy and shared experience. There's thousands of us are unemployed. The system cannot afford to give us that many privileges, relatively speaking. Uh, and our conditions of work are alienating and authoritarian, just as the conditions of work for people in factories are. <laughs> objective privileges and to the extent to which they are, the press, the government and the rest can divide ordinary people from students. It's an attitude that's fostered in order to give people the impression that thinking is something that other people do, nothing to do with them. The press reports of, of student demonstrations, militant students so on, play on that anti-intellectualism and that is part of the oppressive role of education in our society. Now that we have seen education as oppressive, these conscientious options, if you like, are being closed to us. So it is true that you can leave the official society. You can opt out of being the sort of boss class that you've been trained for and become part of an, of an unofficial and new set of social relationships but perhaps a good idea if the Students' Union considered setting up joint committees of students and trade unions. Representatives of the Students' Union coming together on a local basis in order we can work out some common kind of action. If one puts oneself within that set of relationships and makes that one's life task, it's not a moralistic or courageous sort of action, but it's to do what one positively wants to do, to follow our own real needs, to carry out our own liberation and that of everyone else. Fellow students, whatever our failures or success may be today, will be reflected in the future. More so, the time is against us. We've got to move fast. We've got to fight hard. The system has been in existence for centuries. We shall not allow Tatcha and our colleagues to go away with this proposal. Students in this university, the students in Birmingham, have played a major role over a number of years. The first rally which I came to back in my first year was over the government at that time, the Labour government's intention to introduce a discriminatory system, a racist system, of fee paying for overseas students. The students on this campus were united then. They were united in their action in demanding representation and democracy within this institution. And a similar rally took place at the foot of these, this library in 1968. One point has to be made in rallies such as this, which are taking place in 650 out of the 700 student unions and membership of NUS. And from telephone calls, coming into the headquarters of NUS today. Something over 200,000 students at this time at a meeting such as this across the country would show to this government exactly what we as students feel about this government and its proposals. If you look at what is being intended in the James Committee, in the future of college education, 
If you look at the Summers and Coldstream report for art students, those of you who are postgraduates here have seen the Rothschild report on the development of research in universities. If you've looked at the Hazelgrave report for technical education, you'll see that there's a consistent plan behind this government to alter fundamentally the nature of education in this country. We must recognise that one of the reasons why this government wants to weaken our organisations is so that we cannot oppose those inroads, inroads onto the educational system in this country. And when we oppose the present consultative document and all that it stands for, we must recognise that interference by the state, by the government, is exactly what goes on in the fascist countries in Europe at the present moment and across the world. And we're not having that in this country. <laughs> When I went to market for the... <laughs> and I'm glad to say that uh, Victor Feather, on behalf of the TUC, has said to me that the TUC as a whole supports the kind of protests being made against these iniquitous propositions. And I know in talking to this broad, middle-of-the-road type audience <laughs> that if I mention another one of the central forces in our society, like the Labour Party, <laughs> that um, you know I promised to write to them and I know they'll be considering this at their meeting this week. And I expect that we will have the support of the Labour Party as uh, an organised body also in your defence. And then what? They're all promises. What do you expect? No, me, me. Who keeps promises? This gent says, yeah, I do. All right, I do. A million people on the door, they have attacked school children and now they attack the students. They represent a minority, they are defeated in by elections and council elections and have broken all their election promises, they are an illegal government. How do they get away with the tax on the majority? This is because the trade unions and the labour leaders have restricted all opposition to protest. Now, now the NUS proposes the same and unless they change the policy we should be defeated. We have to demand the NUS leave the fight to make the Tories resign, and this can only be done in unity with the working class. Therefore, the NUS must demand the CUC fight as well, and lead a general strike to make the Tories resign and pledge the Labour government to socialist policies. Oh. Oh. Now, the format for this is there's going to be three speakers, and uh, the first one is Anne Naylor, President of the Guild, and I'd like her to speak now. <laughs> They've got their pretext, they've got their excuses. If anybody's read that flaming document, they can see that the administration was downright ridiculous. I think the real reason is much more deep-rooted than that. Over the past few years, we as a student body have become far more organised, far more effective. We've been campaigning against selective education, against apartheid in Rhodesia, against apartheid in South Africa against cutting off free school milk for school children. We've been campaigning for better grants, for better housing for ourselves and everyone, campaigning against the government's policy on unemployment. This is what they're trying to attack. They're trying to attack our political organisations. <laughs> but in doing so, they're not just smashing that activity, they're smashing all the other activities of students' unions. On the way, they're smashing the small societies, the athletic clubs, the ballroom dancing club, the chess club, 
all the small societies which rely on union finance for their very existence. I think in fighting against these proposals, we're not fighting a personal battle against Mrs Thatcher. We're fighting against the whole principle behind this sort of move against us. I think we've got to see this in the context of the other moves of the government to try and curtail the activity of people who are directly against them. You can look at the trade union bill, the immigration bill, for examples of this. In this fight, we are fighting for the right to fight. They are trying to stop us fighting. And we've got to say no loudly and clearly to a registrar as we are doing to this consultative document. smash the bourgeoisie and smash <laughs> smash Thatcher smash the Tory government And what really worries them is that they see a spectre. That spectre happened in France in May 1968, where the students united and fought the government. And in their fight, and in, their, in that fight, in that fight, they managed to mobilise large sections of the working class. We have to fight. And if we fight hard enough, if we fight in a united fashion, we may be able to do something similar in this country. To a state which in no way represents the people. 
We've got to scorch the arses of the government. The TUC was defeated because it didn't adopt militant action. The IRB has been passed. It's an act now. We mustn't fall for the same mistakes of moderate action. Many students are not conscious of the tyranny which exists for many of the smaller colleges in this country, where the students were prevented by their principal from taking action today. There's a lot more propaganda work has to be done so that there's massive mobilisation on January the 23rd when there's a national demonstration in London. And subsequent to that, we can build up if the government will not withdraw this document and will not withdraw our attack, an even more militant strategy which will force this government to reject out of hand these proposals. Thank you. We would provide expert legal help. I'd like to attempt a little political analysis. About 15% at least of all of those who graduated last year are still unemployed. The possession of a first degree, in fact, is going to be no more than having a first blessing from a church. I'm going to look after you. The only words of consolation I can add today are that when you leave, you'll have me waiting for you. <laughs> I'm not really promising to embrace you personally to my warm, slightly scented bosom, although, although, if I have to, I will. So, and between us, in fact, we can help to reform and restructure our society. say that it was a big victory after May and due events because if the working class uh, uh, gained some uh, advantage uh, concerning the wages and very important uh, advantage the purpose of this uh, strike in fact was uh, more political and uh, at the end of uh, this big struggle it was clear that uh, it was possible to overthrow uh, the system himself not only the gold but the capitalism and uh, when the workers uh, return in their factory it's completely false to say that uh, they were very glad and that they had the feeling of a big victory because they they know and after the experience of 36 and after the liberation they know they know now that uh, when the power uh, rests in the hands of the bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie is able to take again all the concession that uh, they were obliged to, to give during the strike. And uh, that, that means that for us it's not a victory, but it's not uh, only um, an échec, uh, as you say, a defeat. It's not only a defeat because uh, uh, after and during the May and June events, many workers and students uh, had been politi politi politized, politicized. politicized, 
and a new vanguard had been created by this movement. Yes, I think we cannot say that the causes is an economic crisis like in 29, because in fact the economic situation was not worse in May or June like uh, two or three years before. There was a permanent crisis. It's clear that there was a stagnation of uh, the wages of the working class and that the goal had taken uh, anti-workers' uh, lows uh, one or two years before. But the, the, the spark of this revolution was a political spark. It was uh, the action of the students. First, the workers uh, had understood the necessity of the solidarity with the action uh, of the students after the repression of the police and and i think it's the more important they have seen that the power uh, which refused every concession during 10 years of traditional action of petition and little strike and so on they have seen that the government uh, was obliged to make concession to the students after a big fight and then in the moment of in the moment where the workers have their own problems they, they have taken the, student, the movement of the student like a model of new action. And after the elementary solidarity action, they uh, decided to uh, use themselves of the new action of the students, and then to occupy the factory to fight against the police and so on. And at this moment, it was economic, of course, revendication and slogans. After it was more political and socialist uh, slogans. But at the beginning, I think that it was, in fact, uh, a new political consciousness, consciousness, uh, yes. of the consciousness of the working class. That we will see the revolution in the metropolitan countries during our lifetime. Oh, I think it's absolutely possible. And the events in May and June in France, and the events, the George strike in Belgium in 61 and 62, and some radical action in Italy show now that it's possible that the capitalism is entering a big crisis. But the problem we have to resolve is to have a new revolutionary direction and party to uh, to use such a movement uh, to the socialism. We are in a revolutionary period now in Europe, but the problem is, I repeat, to have the program and organization able to, to, uh, to uh, lead to such a revolution.